Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at Gluster FS10 right after this. Actually, we're going to be looking at 10.1. So 10.0 came out in November just about the 21st or so, and then they released a patch release about February 1st or so. What's in 10? What's different about it? The main thing is they've added this huge performance uh, change, which is, <laughs> they've been kind of doing this the last few releases where they've been increasing performance for small files. 20% improvement on small file handling, as well as it is actually benefiting large files as well. Now, of course, they're not, they haven't collected data out here yet with us, but yeah, I'll probably get turned in some. One of the problems that they, they discovered was with glibc in handling the thread-based pools, performance was not that great. When they moved over to TC Malik, it got a lot better. So... That's one of the that's one of the reasons why the performance is improved with 10.1 and 10.0. Uh, what is Gluster? So Gluster FS is a volume. It, it has the concept of a volume of storage, and that is a collection of servers that belong to a trusted uh, storage pool. So you can't just go fetch data off of a Gluster cluster. You have to have you have to be a member of the of the trusted storage pool. And you do that by managing a key exchange that occurs uh, in in the uh, Gluster uh, CLI interface. So uh, now, if you're on Red Hat, you actually have a GUI that allows you to do this. But unfortunately, us guys out here in the free and open source world, we don't get that GUI. So, yeah, two pieces to it. There's a management daemon called Gluster D that runs on each server, and that manages. Uh, the system as a whole, but also there's a, uh, it manages a brick process called cluster file SD, which in turn exports the underlying disk storage. And in my case, it's XFS. You can also use ZFS here. Now, I haven't heard them talk about ext4 recently. Uh, and quite honestly, I, I'll just, I just use XFS. Uh, for this uh, because I'm running on real small servers to begin with so they're not big um, there is a number of volume types that you can deploy in a Gluster uh, network so this is how you configure a Gluster to a specific purpose that you have in mind for your storage pool so the first one is a distributed volume and that is the default cluster type uh, that is configured. So if you don't give it any parameters other than the servers, you're going to get a distributed volume. Distributed volumes are distributed across all the servers. And as you can see, uh, I'm, I'm copying the file to one brick or the other, but it's, there's no redundancy involved here. So a copy of that file doesn't exist anywhere else. If you lose one of those bricks, you lose the files that were stored there. Yeah, so yeah, it'd be total data loss for those particular files. However, it is the easiest and cheapest way to scale and expand storage. So, uh, I mean, as long as you had, it would be an acceptable way of using the pool if you had, uh, you know, some underlying data uh, structure that was providing redundancy um, on in your just simple. The other type is replicated volumes. Replicated volumes maintain exact copies of the data. So file one is going to be stored on server one and server two. Uh, if you set it up as your replica is equal to two, and then same with file two, it's going to be stored in both places. So you're basically duplicating data uh, in this particular uh, management scheme. But there's a, there is a benefit to doing that, of course, and just like a mirror, that would be during the access time is that Gluster could choose whichever server was less busy to return the data for your files. You have to have at least two bricks in a replicated pool. They do recommend three, and there's a reason for that, which has to do with the split brain. But it does offer, the, obviously, the best redundancy and reliability. It's just it doesn't offer you the best 
uh, storage mechanism for your your dollar. So yeah, um, there's also distributed replicated uh, cluster volumes, and this is combining distributed with replicated volumes in order to offer redundancy at the same time offering easy scale out. So yeah, files are o only replicated between servers. So file one would only exist on a server and the replicated volume zero. There's also a dispersed volume. Those are based on erasure codes. It stripes the encoded data files across uh, the, the bricks and there is some redundancy that's added as you can see. Uh, that you do get some redundancy that's applied across the uh, multiple bricks in the pool. Uh, dispersed volumes have a configured level of reliability and they're attempting to minimize the amount of space that the files take. Uh, there is also a hybrid of that. There's the distributed dispersed volumes, which you can add to it as well if you want to have additional scale out capability. But because this allows you to, in this case, in, in groups of three, you can keep uh, adding additional storage onto the systems as you go. So there's also geo-replication, geo-replication that you can uh, get uh, into operation if you need that. So basically you're replicating your data from one site to another. And I've talked about this before, but you can also cascade replications to multiple sites. So if you have uh, multiple pools that are out across the globe, for example, you can replicate across by cascading them uh, from one to another. You can replicate over a LAN, you can replicate over a, a WAN, and of course you can replicate across the internet too. There are mechanisms for encrypting the data before it is in flight across the network, so you can employ those. Uh, GlusterFS is a user space file system, and I remember some talks uh, when the developers were talking about this. It just offers them the freedom to make updates, make major changes, and not have to get the kernel team involved every time they want to produce an update to the system because most of your file systems are actually stored inside of the kernel. Whereas as in this particular uh, case, Gluster is running out in your user space as an application, so it doesn't need the uh, help from the, uh, the development team to do anything. So in order to interact with the kernel virtual file system, Gluster FS makes use of something called the file system in user space or Fuse. And Fuse permits the creation of any kind of file system without the involvement from the kernel team. So if you want to write your own, you can. And, uh, and then you can use Fuse in order to tie it into the kernel so that you can use standard file systems in the VFS pool to be mounted in your system. So Gluster uses something called a translator. And a translator is basically a, a function that you need in order to perform a certain task. Translators have, all, have multiple roles they can perform. They can modify requests. So if they get a request and they need to do something about it, like for example, in the performance, it might adjust a workload. So it may modify that request to modify the workload. Translators can intercept or block requests. There are also, translators can spawn new requests. So if there's something additional that the translator needs, it like for example, it, it wants to call the debug interface or it wants to call the performance interface, it can request those translators to come into play as well. What it looks like from the big picture is you have the client on the left, server on the right, the translator in between. So as far as the client is concerned, they mount the file system as a virtual file system. Mounts like a standard file system, except the type is GlusterFS. I'm, gonna, I'm planning on doing a lab where I'm gonna come in and show you how to configure those various volume types. GlusterFS, it's not your granddaddy's network file system, that's for sure. I've scaled it, I started out with four terabyte and I'm now at 64. And that's over a period of eight years. You can grow this the way you want. Uh, you can start small, and then as you're as you need to, to store more and more data, you can certainly do that with it. So uh, I have taken systems down that were in the pool while the cluster was working, and no loss of data. It comes back up. The server, when it comes up, it rebalances and off the races it goes. It's easy to scale to up to handle petabytes of data. I mean, there uh, there are some very large organizations that are using Gluster. 
there's a lot of large organizations using Ceph. I mean, they both have their uses. Why did I choose Gluster FS? I guess I'm making videos, and um, I did have some idea when I started about how much data I would I would might need over a course of a year in order to build the videos that I wanted to do. Say, you know, a 20 minute video three times a week for each week. Then I have an idea about what I'm going to store. However, the as I'm learning more about the capabilities of what I can do with the video editing, I have been gradually adding additional features on. As far as Gluster FS, it just works. I can restart a Gluster node even while the cluster is working. Try that with a NAS. Uh, I would recommend it. Don't don't just rip a drive out <laughs> while you're running. That's I can uh, I can restart a cluster even while it's running. Don't lot don't lose any data at all. When I initially started, I, I was kind of nervous about it because I hadn't used Gluster before. So about for the first six months, I kind of eyeballed it and kind of watched it carefully to make sure uh, that it wasn't going to do something weird. And I wasn't putting data over that I didn't have backed up somewhere else. So it was kind of a backup uh, for some of my data, but it wasn't the only backup. It was just more of a trial and error and make sure it was going to work. Eventually, I just started trusting it. It was fine. And now, yeah, I now, it, now the backups go the other way. GlusterFS is not too difficult to scale. It's it's basically add the drives and to whatever uh, whatever volume you have mounted and, and then rebalance and you're done. Uh, and yeah, you still need to back up your data. Sorry, it doesn't help you with that. That's all I had for today. I, uh, I plan on doing that. I'm going to try to do a live stream so you guys, if you want to ask questions, you can. Uh, and then I'll go through how to set up a cluster, cluster from scratch and what you need to have on the system to do that. And then we'll go through, I guess probably the best way to do it is maybe uh, build a, a couple of different volume types and then we'll just play around with them and see what how well they perform. And like I said, we can go see where the data is stored out in the actual uh, in the actual pool on which server it's in and all that stuff. So yeah, we'll take a look at that. Hope to see you then. Bye for now.